Hi, I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. Welcome to Nature Insight. Speed dating with the future. When speed dating, you're taking the chance that investing a few moments of your time to listen might change your life. Our hope is that Nature Insight will offer you a similar opportunity, a chance to listen for a short time to new perspectives on nature and our shared world. I'm a science teacher in New York City. And I'm the head of communications at IPBIS, the world biodiversity platform for science and policy. Throughout this series, we're introducing you to the world's leading experts on biodiversity and nature's contributions to people. Their research helps to better inform global decisions and can help us all make healthier, happier, and more sustainable choices. The idea of international law, that sovereign countries choose to take on obligations and commit to other countries that they'll deliver on these, is one that's always interested me, Britt. Well, in that case, who are you introducing us to in this episode? I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Michelle Lim, Senior Lecturer at the Macquarie Law School in Sydney, Australia. Michelle was a fellow on the IPBIS Global Assessment, and you might remember, Britt, that assessment identified governance as one of the major indirect drivers of biodiversity loss. Now, we know that laws are important parts of governance, but I asked Michelle if law is also an effective tool in tackling the nature crisis. The key message coming out of the IPBES Global Assessment and a range of other assessments, this need for transformative change across economic and, and social systems. And yes, law can be a key part of that transformative change, and it needs to be. It allows and enables large-scale action. A lot of, you could say, the neoliberal narrative is that individuals playing their part can solve the nature crisis, when really what is needed is, yes, individual actions are so important, but being able to bring together not only individual action, but corporate action and government action, that's where the transformative change can happen. And we see this with masks and COVID and the role that law can play. When masks are mandated, then you're seeing a much greater use of masks, not only because of the legal mandate, but because of the the behaviour change it creates because something is legally mandated. So I think, therefore, it can similarly have an important role in shaping how people act in relation to nature. One of the big discussions that came out from the IPBIS Global Assessment was that truly transformative change has to be a major shift, not just a gradual change. What does that look like for law? Because it it doesn't sound to me like law can change overnight. You're absolutely right, because it isn't just about changing laws overnight. What needs to occur before there can be any form of legal change is that underpinning value change across society of, one, not taking nature for granted, and two, exploring the range of values of nature, not only what nature can do for us, but also our responsibilities to nature and to others. And importantly, transformative change in law cannot be something that's restricted to environmental law, things as broad as media law. A certain media conglomerate has such power over the narratives that are being played out in terms of climate, less so with biodiversity because it doesn't have that same profile, but a need for a change in the way that people are getting information, the narratives around what sort of change is needed but also changes to corporate regulation as well. So in that sense, not just going, oh, we'll leave it up to the consumer to make ecologically and equitably conscious choices. Let's think about who bears the burden of doing the right thing, essentially, Mm. and regulating that in a way that we can push forward 
the transformations needed across the range of societal, economic and other sectors highlighted, for example, in the IPES Global Assessment. We always hear about the limitations, for instance, of cross-border issues. So, you know, that there's a river that flows through three countries and the country that's upstream creates a dam and the countries downstream object to the dam, but they don't find a mechanism through international law to make a case particularly about use or even on environmental issues. I mean, can international law enforce environmental protection? Often the example I post to my students is how many people in this class have ever received a letter from overseas? Everyone's hand goes up, of course. Well, that's international law in practice. The treaty on the postal system where countries agree that they will distribute the mail regardless, I mean, it doesn't always happen, but regardless of the political situation that international law does work most of the time. It just works in a different way, where countries are concerned with not acting in such a way that goes against the agreed norms or laws, if you like, of the international community, so the community of, of countries. Are there examples of legal mechanisms in international law that are working to enforce environmental protection? Yeah, so, so CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, is a really good example of where trade mechanisms have been very effective to control, as the name suggests, right, the trade of endangered species. So through the use of its trade mechanisms, allowing those restrictions to be placed on either the importing country or it allows the country where the endangered species comes into to be confiscated and, and those sorts of things. There's limitations, of course, that it deals only in the trade of particular species, which are an important but not the only driver of biodiversity loss, and then only in endangered species, but then those trade mechanisms are important as well. Trade certainly then sounds like one example where it works. But when people think about law and the environment, I imagine many people think about climate change, because we've been hearing a lot, particularly with COP26 in Glasgow, about countries with uh, their legally binding commitments to reduce climate change. But while COP26 got so much attention and, and coverage, there's also another COP that's about to happen, which is COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention. And we don't hear as much about that. We also don't hear as much about legally binding commitments for the biodiversity process. Why is that? So you've got the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change on the one hand and the Convention on Biological Diversity on the other. Both conventions function as framework conventions, that is, they're broad conventions which have the opportunity for more specific binding agreements to be concluded under those conventions. The key difference between the Paris Agreement on the one hand under the Climate Convention and the post-2020 framework on the other is the hybrid nature of the binding, non-binding nature of the Paris Agreement. In contrast, no similar binding component within the post-2020 framework. And the fact that even with a hybrid binding, non-binding Paris Agreement, we're looking at potential temperature rises which take us far beyond the 1.52 degree target under Paris, it bodes terribly when there isn't even the level of Paris in terms of the legal commitments of states to the post-2020 biodiversity framework. If you look back over the last decade, where are the bright spots? Where are the points of hope from either of those processes which you would lift up and show to your students or show to people you're having conversations with and say, it's not as bad as it seems? I mean, there must be some of those bright spots, right? Bringing it back to IPES, if you look at the draft post-2020 framework, the first 
seven, I think, targets are directly reflecting the five key direct drivers of biodiversity loss, land use change, direct exploitation of species, climate change, invasive species, pollution, tick, 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 tick. So <laughs> you've got science going directly into some sort of agreement, I won't call it going directly into law, but into yeah. a globally agreed plan for what's needed for the planet. And also, if you look at the target-based approach under the convention itself, the target-based approach started with the 2010 target, which basically was so broad as along the lines of significantly reduce the extent of biodiversity loss while dealing with issues of poverty and sustainable development, something along those lines. So they spent most of the time leading up to the target working out, well, what exactly are we doing? Mm -hmm. So that meant that for Aichi, there were much more focused 20 targets across the range of objectives of the convention. So Importantly, target 17 of the Aichi targets relates to national biodiversity strategies and action plans, which is the reporting by particular countries. It's self-reporting, but prior to Aichi, a lot of countries weren't even doing that self-reporting. So Aichi's really pushed that reporting up. So yes, lessons have been learned and there's been a bit of an improvement, a bit of improvement. We are learning the lessons, but in order to really address the closing window of opportunity to avoid mass extinction, much, much more is needed than what we're currently seeing, even though they are, as you say, bright spots. Definitely. Michelle, just shifting gears slightly here, I often think of laws as a way of addressing a power imbalance. So protecting people perhaps who don't have much power against those who do. And today, there really there are so many vulnerable groups of people who their lives and their well being are being threatened by, amongst other things, the destruction of nature. And I'm thinking here of, for instance, climate refugees, indigenous peoples, and local communities. Does law offer any avenues for ordinary people to get environmental justice or to address some of these power imbalances? We're seeing in the climate change space very innovative ways in which the courts have been used for climate justice. The Agenda case, which was the first successful case ever in a domestic court, was heard in the Netherlands. So they ran a case based on the tort of negligence, arguing that the Dutch government had been negligent because of their duty to protect citizens from climate change and therefore they were not living up to their duty of care to particular citizens. So they won on the negligence issue, which was appealed by the Dutch government, and it won again on issues of, of human rights under the EU convention. But on the flip side... The IPBES Global Assessment identified that in lands protected by Indigenous and local communities, there's significantly greater outcomes for biodiversity. Yep. However, often persisting colonial frameworks mean that the lands that have been protected by Indigenous and local communities for thousands of years are being eroded through law. So... Yes, law can play a role, but often it plays an undermining role in terms of justice and, and, and rights. So yes, a whole lot of potential, but <laughs> at the same time, it depends on whether you use it for good or, or for evil, essentially. You might uh, have heard in, in our first season of Nature Insight, we had an episode focused on looking at indigenous relationships with nature. And we spoke to Dr. Anne Polina, who I think you have a, a personal relationship with. I think for a lot of people who are not familiar with indigenous communities, it's often thought of that there's this almost fuzzy relationship or sort of a, a hard to understand relationship between people as a species living in an ecosystem and their relationship with those ecosystems. And, you know, yes, there's better conservation in some of these areas, but I don't think many people see that as law. I first met Anne when I went to the Kimberley, which is this beautiful part of Australia, which has 
wonderful biological diversity, but the cultural diversity is, is, is just amazing. And I went there with this project to look at a systems approach to law, you know, <laughs> reflecting the very compartmentalised, I suppose, way in which the dominant Western legal system, but also the scientific system, thinks about nature as quite separate, right? Mm. With, you know, humans, probably men <laughs> at the top, and then nature being something that needs to be controlled and subordinated compared to that relationship and obligation to country, to the different components of lands and waters. And having this opportunity to, to collaborate with Anne and thinking in different conceptualizations of, of what the future could be, who the subjects of law are, for example, the river being a subject of law and, and who they could be within the courts, within the Western systems as well. What I also really enjoyed was the concept of personality and, and of standing, the idea that the river itself had a personality and had rights. And, 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 and I think one of the examples that I read about recently, also in your part of the world in New Zealand, was a court decision that actually gave legal personality to a river. So that's the Whanganui case in New Zealand. And, and a lot of my discussions with Anne was what sort of possibility is there for something similar to occur in Australia. And I, I won't bore you with the history of the difference, <laughs> colonial yes. and constitutional differences, which make it difficult here, but important to highlight the work that Anne, the range of communities along the river have done in the absence of the Western legal frameworks recognising the legal personhood of the river. You've got communities along the river and they've come together with their own declaration for the river and an eight-point plan of what it means to give effect to Indigenous law. So in many ways, exercising sovereignty over their lands, they're like, we're just doing it because we have this authority. We are articulating our relationship to land through our own declaration. So let's hear from Dr. Anne Polina. There is just overwhelming evidence about what we should be doing right. It's time for the humans to right-size the planet. We are an amazing creature because we are human beings. But in order to reach our full potential and to bring others with us, we have to realise that what we're going into requires a level of being brave. You can listen to more of what Anne had to say to Brit in episode two of season one of this podcast. Michelle, have you benefited personally from your involvement in the IPAS assessments? What I've really enjoyed of being part of the global assessment as well as the IPAS IPCC report is if you're looking to consider how do we make laws that are fit for purpose, that can address and can deliver the transformative change called for by the IPBES Global Assessment, to have had those interactions with the multiple experts across so many disciplines and having exposure to that cutting edge knowledge that brings so much to the research I do now because you can then evaluate existing legal frameworks through that lens. You can say, how does this law deal with the issue of telecoupling, for example, which... <laughs> a difficult concept for most people. A difficult concept, the hyperconnected nature of the causes of biodiversity loss. So if you look at most laws are about what happens within, within each particular country, that is clearly inadequate in the reality of our current globalised, interconnected world. 
and therefore the need for legal frameworks to live up to it. So that's been a wonderful part of being part of the, the IPBES Global Assessment and the IPBES IPCC report as well. But also the other way around, saying bringing a degree of legal voice and legal perspective into the science policy interface, I think that also has great value. So I always like to end an interview with a blue sky question. <laughs> so here's one for you, Michelle. If you could change any one thing about how the international legal system operates today, what would it be? I might be a bit cheeky in my response because changing any one thing is, is, is a big ask. But I think it's key that we address the fundamental underlying values that drive the existing legal system and are perpetuated by them when they go into law. As the IPBES Global Assessment calls for, to shift away from notions of nature which are about either commodifying nature or perpetuate consumerism and over-exploitation. So getting that right, I think, is key. And then also thinking about how to do that within our hyperconnected world. So rethinking the international law system. So it's not just about the international law framework, but how those links occur across the various scales. For example, in the climate space, how the EU is regulating the actions of Australia on climate, not through an international law space, but just the EU limiting the import of goods from Australia, that's adding tools to the range of ways in which we can do an international law plus, which considers the scales at which action can occur in a legal context. I see what you did there. You snuck in behavior and value change into just legal system change as well. So <laughs> it's a really blue sky answer. <laughs> Thanks so much, Michelle. It's been a great pleasure having a, a chance to hear your perspectives on some of these really important issues. Thanks, Rob. It really is amazing to realize that changing justice systems and laws really doesn't change without a change in values, which then change behavior, especially when we have so many different belief systems all interacting as one under this umbrella of environmental justice. You know, we have environmental rights enshrined as fundamental human rights. And we actually saw that just this past October when the UN Human Rights Council recognized having a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as an actual human right. Yeah, you know, Britt, that really was the culmination of decades of work by some really dedicated NGOs, activists, indigenous peoples, and even businesses, and many more. It was a great victory, and, and it really opens the door to use this recognition of the healthy environment as a human right as a basis for even more actions and initiatives through law. And we heard from Michelle about some of the groundbreaking court cases that have already taken place to advance legal personality and the, the rights of nature in some ways through the legal system. And as Michelle said, while most laws might be looking at what happens in an individual country, we are totally globalized and interconnected. So we've really got to look at these fundamental underlying values that drive existing legal systems, just as the IPIS Global Assessment calls for. I thought it was interesting also that Michelle, as a legal scholar, felt the need to emphasize that law can do harm to nature as much as it can do good for nature. I, for one, like to think of law as the opportunity to advance a positive agenda, but she was also making the point that there are instances where that's not been the case. Let's hope that in rethinking the approach of law and, and, and environment, that we can find ways to channel legal power and, and legal tools to better protect nature. Well, and what better international law subject than something that is in fact international, which is biodiversity and all of the species we interact and share this world with. That's it for Nature Insight, speed dating with the future. I'm Rob Spall. And I'm Britt Garner. 
And again, a big thanks to Dr. Michelle Lim for joining us in this episode. Michelle talked a lot about values in relation to the nature crisis, and I'll be exploring that in more detail in the next episode with Patty Balvanera, a co-chair of the IPBIS Values Assessment. We explored some of these issues in season one of Nature Insight, and I'll be finding out from Patty what has changed and why we need to revisit such important topics. And in the meantime, you can learn more about IPBIS's work on www.ipbis.net or on any of our social media channels. Just search for at IPBES. That's at I-P-B-E-S. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with episode five.